event. With that, DG, you have the floor. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this um, event. I am very happy uh, to see lots of um, uh, people, both uh, from uh, the member states and uh, from our staff. And um, uh, perhaps today we have more women, and, um, uh, and I'm uh, very, very happy uh, to see them. The IAEA uh, has uh, been celebrating uh, this um, uh, International Women's Day uh, for years. And um, I have been attending uh, these events every year. And um, uh, the activity uh, and celebration is uh, becoming more and uh, more active year by year. And I would like to congratulate you uh, for that. The representation of women uh, in the IAEA uh, was not uh, that high. And, um, um, as far as I know, uh, there has been uh, no uh, women candidate uh, for my post, and there has been no director general, uh, female director general uh, in the IEA. And um, uh, when I became the director general of uh, this agency in 2009, the representation of women was um, around 22% uh, between one fourth and one fifth. Um, so I took that issue up and tried uh, to uh, increase uh, the proportion of women among the staff. Now, still we have to do a lot, but now uh, the representation of women among the staff is um, around 30%. For the first time, uh, we, uh, um, we crossed uh, the, uh, the ceiling of uh, 30%. And uh, we have two uh, DDGs, um, female DDGs, and I'm expecting uh, to have another uh, and uh, make uh, the representation at the highest level of staff uh, on equal, 50-50%. Uh, and some, um, for uh, that purpose, uh, the IAEA secretary has made a number of, um, of um, uh, initiatives. We uh, organized a, a panel discussion in the general conference uh, last year uh, on the environment of uh, women. And we have encouraged member states to make women uh, available uh, for uh, the technical cooperation training course uh, or a member of uh, the, the missions that we sent uh, to other countries. Um, we also have organized um, the uh, symposium on safeguard in November last year. And um, we have discussed, um, we have had a panel discussion how to improve on the balance of men and women in uh, the uh, safeguard uh, department. Uh, to be uh, frank, uh, the representation of uh, uh, women in a uh, safeguard department is not that high, and I can uh, understand the reason. And of, uh, for the women around um, uh, in the middle of 30, 40, it is very difficult uh, to leave um, uh, uh, home and spend a month um, in the field, and um, I had some uh, discussion with them, and they registered some difficulties. But um, uh, there may be ways uh, to address this issue, and the um, uh, panel discussion was very helpful for that. And um, um, we have also organized um, um, a meeting uh, for excellent, very capable women uh, to share uh, the stories. And, um, um, listening uh, to the stories of um, uh, these um, uh, leading women, both the successful stories and um, difficult stories, are uh, very um, uh, are useful uh, for those um, um, women who are considering uh, for higher posts. And um, um, we are also encouraging young women uh, to study um, uh, nuclear uh, science. I visited um, uh, many countries and I visited high schools in the Philippines or in the United States, and I, um, um, I saw more women having interest in nuclear technology than I thought. Um, and, uh, but um, uh, many of them are rather interested in um, um, biology, uh, uh, but I'm not very much interested in a nuclear power plant operation. Uh, that's a fact, but um, uh, it doesn't mean uh, that women are not interested in uh, nuclear uh, technology. They are interested, and um, uh, I'm very uh, hopeful for the future. 
working environment is also uh, very important. And uh, we are making um, uh, some uh, efforts. For example, we have um, uh, strengthened our framework uh, to address harassment and sexual harassment. Uh, there was a change uh, in, in the United Nations. And perhaps we are uh, the first international organization uh, that um, 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 amended uh, um, internal rule in line with um, the new uh, UN uh, rule. Of course, harassment or sexual harassment can, um, um, can uh, take place between um, men and men, or between women and women, uh, but um, uh, um, uh, improving uh, the sexual harassment and harassment policy uh, will contribute uh, to improve uh, the working environment. Uh, from January this year, um, we have um, introduced um, uh, more flexible working hours uh, to achieve a better uh, work-life balance. I hope um, uh, these efforts will lead uh, to um, a better uh, environment uh, for women uh, to work. I'm feeling, um, um, uh, I have a sense of um, a change of trend. <coughs> Um, uh, not uh, very dramatic, but to a gradual, uh, gradual um, uh, change. Uh, the staff uh, survey shows uh, that uh, staff are happy with uh, their uh, workload. And um, uh, if you look more closely uh, to the women's representation, uh, department by department, uh, some uh, department has a quite high uh, level of representation. For example, my office, uh, DGOC, and the uh, management um, 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 uh, department has 48%, uh, almost equal. And the um, um, technical cooperation department, uh, 46%. Some um, other um, uh, department have uh, strong potentials to increase uh, the um, uh, representation of women. Uh, it is also true that uh, some, um, uh, some uh, departments have uh, difficulties um, uh, because of the nature of their work, uh, but um, uh, there are hopes uh, that we can increase uh, the, uh, the representation of women. Um, in order to increase um, uh, the, uh, pr the proportion of women among the staff, I think we need uh, to take um, uh, bottom-up and top-down approach, both. And um, uh, for example, having uh, more women at the highest level of the agency uh, will uh, help to change uh, the atmosphere of uh, the working environment. Um, at the same time, um, uh, daily efforts uh, to look into uh, the recruitment and um, uh, making, a, uh, uh, making a judgment in each recruitment process is um, needed. Uh, to uh, increase uh, the number of uh, women. Uh, we have encouraged all recru recruitment officers uh, to have this in mind when uh, they are engaged in, uh, in recruitment. Uh, support from our member states is uh, very crucial, and um, uh, it is um, more than uh, you think. Um, I have, uh, I have um, found a golden rule in this area. If you identify either a company or a country, identifies a very capable woman, and if you do not want to lose him or lose her, please introduce them to us. <laughs> There's a high possibility that we can take them. Too bad for you, uh, but um, um, we can benefit uh, from that with this remark. Uh, thank you very much, and, uh, and uh, I congratulate this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, DG, for your inspiring remarks. It demonstrates the real progress that we're making here at the agency and our continued commitment to ensure that we reach gender equality. I'd like to welcome all of you, excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, and for those watching on our social media networks, welcome to our International Women's Day event. As I noted earlier, this is our 14th year recognizing International Women's Day. It shows our commitment to gender equality and our motto, Adams for Peace and Development. International Women's Day is not only a day to share and celebrate achievements, but it's also a day to remind ourselves of the importance of an equal workplace. And what I've learned in my time here as the Director General for Management 
Deputy Director General for Management, is that it's the stories, the stories of how we've each have come here to the agency that really matter and how we connect. Last year at the General Conference, we had a side event that was entitled Promoting Gender Equality, Leadership in Action. And it talked about how each of us can show our own personal leadership to inspire action and to motivate and continuously remind each other of the value of the equality that we're searching for in gender equality. The agency has done a lot and will continue to do more in establishing policies that support gender equality. And strong organizational efforts are devoted every day to ensuring this, and you've heard about some of these from our Director General. But what I've learned also is, again, these personal stories are what really help each of us become more inspired to advocate for gender equality. Sometimes our stories can be challenging and talk about the diversity that each of us feel. But the best part about these stories, and it's evidence when you see our accomplished colleagues here, is that for every setback, there is a victory. And this victory is demonstrated by our representation here at the agency. So today, we've tried something different. And that difference is going to be that instead of having a traditional panel, um, we're going to do a little bit of a free-for-all, inspiring story approach. Today, we're going to hear inspiring stories that give voice to three accomplished women in the nuclear field. And this new format will give us more freedom to have a better connection with each of you as we tell these stories. So with that, I'd like to say that I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Ms. Rumina Velshi. She's the president and CEO of the Canadian Nuclear Society Commission. She has extensive technical, regulatory, and adjudication experience in the energy sector, and was previously director for planning and control for the Darlington New Nuclear Project in Ontario, Canada. Rumina is very active in the promotion of careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, known as STEM. And she's especially uh, focused on young women and their career paths. She's also the recipient of the 2011 Women in Nuclear Canada Leadership Award. So with that, please join me in welcoming Ms. Romina Velshi, who will share her story with all of us today. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, DJ Amano, and thank you, Mary Alice Hayward, for uh, inviting me to this very special event. I feel very honored and privileged to come and uh, share with you my stories. I took on this role as president and CEO of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission about six months ago. And one of the reasons why I took on this job was that it gave me a platform to promote STEM careers for uh, particularly young girls and, uh, and women. And not only within the CNSC, but within our licensee community, and uh, with a forum like this, even at the international stage. And I, in, in the last six months, I've been going around to various audiences to talk about uh, why we need greater gender equality, what it's going to take, and how each and every one of us has a role to play. And quite often, I get the reaction, well, what can I as an individual do? Because it's such a daunting task. And it reminds me of the hummingbird story that the Kenyan Nobel laureate, um, Ms. Mathai, made very popular. And the hummingbird story is that there was this huge forest fire, and all the animals made a dash to get out of the fire, except for the little hummingbird. And as the animals stood at the outskirts of the forest, looking to see what was going on, the little hummingbird would be dashing to the river, pick up a few beads of water, and try to quench the fire. And they, and they looked at the hummingbird in puzzlement and, uh, and with a bit of mockery asked the hummingbird, what are you doing? And the hummingbird said, I'm doing everything I can to put out the fire. And I find that very inspirational because if each and every one of us did everything we could to get gender equality, we'll get there. 
And so today, I'm doing my little bit for gender equality by sharing my stories with you. And I'd like to cover four areas today. One is why I picked engineering. I'm a graduate of engineering. Why I picked nuclear. Uh, a little bit of thoughts on uh, what the current scene is like in, uh, in Canada when it comes to women in nuclear and STEM overall. And then leave with some remarks on what I see going forward. So why engineering? I came to Canada in the early 1970s as a refugee from Uganda. I was a teenager and didn't really have a clue of what I wanted to do when I grew up. But the advice I had got from my parents was, get a good education. As refugees that had found out that when you get booted out, kicked out of a country, your material possessions mean nothing. But your smarts and your education is something that will always be with you. So get a good ed education, pick a career that you're interested in, something that you enjoy doing, that you're good at, and be financially independent. And the last one was important. I come from a family of four girls with no, no brothers, uh, so a story for another day. But the financial independence was very key. So I went to my guidance counselor to see, well, you know, I'm kind of trying to figure out what I want to do. And uh, she wasn't much help, but she did give me the program for the University of Toronto. And she says, well, kind of go through this and see what grabs your interest. And I knew what I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be a doctor, didn't want to be an accountant, didn't want to be a teacher. So I went through the program and made a short list. And one of the things on my short list was that of civil engineering. I liked the description that it offered about civil engineering program. And I liked the image that was next to civil engineering. It was that of a suspension bridge. And I have this penchant for suspension bridges and even symbolically what, um, what they convey. And that weekend, coincidentally, in our local newspaper was a write-up on the Brooklyn Bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge is this, was the longest uh, suspension bridge at, at the time connecting Manhattan to Brooklyn. And it, it was an, an intriguing story about the bridge. But there were two takeaways for me about that bridge. One was that the chief engineer for that bridge had become very ill and was disabled. And it was his wife, Emily Rebling, who actually took over the management of the project and brought it to finish. And secondly, how the public had very little trust in the bridge when it got first opened and wouldn't cross it. And they brought a herd of elephants to go over the bridge to, to demonstrate that it was uh, strong and sturdy enough. But I thought, this is the universe sending me messages that civil engineering is something you really need to take on. And with that, I took up civil engineering. And it wasn't until my first day in the classroom, when I looked around, class of about 105, and there were three women, and I realized, oh, I guess this isn't terribly appealing to women. And, and you know what? I, I mean, I don't know if I would have made a different decision if I'd known that. I, I doubt it. Uh, but I really, frankly, I was very fortunate that no one had uh, tried to talk me out of it. So reflecting on my time in engineering school, I really had a great time. I was very different from all the other students, not only because of my gender and my ethnicity. Um, I didn't drink alcohol. And that was a key requirement because uh, uh, heavy drinking was a big part of uh, being an engineering student. And I, and I wasn't also in team sports much. Uh, but in spite of that, I really did belong. And, um, and I was treated as an equal throughout my life uh, as, a, as an engineering student. And, and again, as I look back, engineering school was so different. And you kind of shake your head and you go, I cannot believe that that's what what it was like. One of the rituals I had, for instance, was the Lady Godiva event. And I'm not kidding you. They had, they used to, it was a fundraising event. And you know, when you're doing fundraising, all kinds of atrocious behaviors seem to be acceptable. And, and, and in this particular case, they would hire a prostitute who would then go through the campus on a horse, bare naked, and then would get auctioned off. Now, I never really participated in, the, in that fundraising event, but that was totally acceptable in those days in engineering school. And if those of you who've seen the movie Hidden Figures, 
Well, remember the women had to run one kilometer just to get to a washroom? Well, my reality in those days was not that different. In my engineering building, five floors high, one washroom for women. So between uh, you know, different sessions, you, you'd see the, the dozen women uh, in the years running up and down the stairs to, to go to the two stalls that, that were there for the building. But times have changed. But I, I, I do want to convey to you that those were really good times because I was treated as an equal, um, because I was assessed based on my intelligence and my merit. And my differences were actually appreciated. But that wasn't the same when I started working. I joined Ontario Hydro uh, when I graduated. It was one of the largest employers of engineers in Canada at the time. And, uh, and it had a very good engineering trainee program where you spent the first couple of years going around through different parts of the organization to find out which part you really wanted to focus your career on. And I picked nuclear because in Ontario in those days, nuclear was in its heyday. And even today, 60% of our electricity comes from our nuclear power plants. But in those days, in the late uh, 1970s, early 1980s, there were new nuclear plants that had just come online. There were many under construction, many on the, uh, in the engineering stage, many at the conceptual stage. It was heyday for nuclear. So lots of opportunities. And I picked nuclear because of the opportunities, but also because nuclear to me symbolized humanity's great achievement of a technology. And even today, when you go to an Apple store and you go to the Genius Bar to get help, what's the icon that's used to demonstrate the Genius Bar? It's an atom, because that's what geniuses are, right? And nuclear, to me, actually symbolized that. And when I went, and I, and I worked in different parts in the engineering, construction, but when I went to work at the Pickering Nuclear Power Plant, and I was one of the first nuclear in, uh, energy workers there, life was very difficult. The plant was not built ever expecting women to work there. There were no change rooms for women. And so for me to get into radiation area clothing, they kind of makeshift a, uh, a room where I could go change, broke all the very fundamentals of contamination control where you entered one way, came out the same way. And that change room was a good hiding spot for people to get some sleep in the night shift. So after a couple of embarrassing moments of stepping out of a shower to find people sleeping in the locker area, I started to lock up um, the, the, the change room. They didn't have radiation area clothing for women. You had to wear what men wore and sizes too big. And there was pornography everywhere, everywhere, even in the control room. And Pickering was the showpiece for, for Ontario. We used to get all kinds of VIPs go through that control room. And you'd open a manual and you'd go, oh my gosh. But you know, but, but that was our reality in those days. And in order to survive or to thrive, there were certain things you had to do. You had to be tough. You had to be desensitized, and you had to pick your battles. And I remember that because we had Pickering B under construction in those days, there were construction workers, stereotypical construction workers, cat calls, wolf whistles as you'd walk by. And I wouldn't go around on my own, except for Friday afternoons when uh, they had the afternoon off where I could go on my own and crawl under the pipes and, and look around. But that was the reality then. So why do I share these stories with you? To show that life has really changed. Because when I tell this to people, you know, they find it unfathomable. And thank goodness for that. Though I understand that there's some parts of the world where that may still be the reality, unfortunately. But not in Ontario. And, and, I, and I'll give you some examples on how life has changed. Last month I was uh, visiting the Darlington Nuclear Power Plant, which is undergoing refurbishment, life extension. And, and you see a lot more women around uh, in, at, at all different levels. You see clothing for women, change rooms for women. And the one that I was so pleasantly surprised with is I had to submit a, a urine sample, a bioassay sample, before I could go inside the reactor uh, building. And the sample containers for women 
were bigger than they have for men. They have actually recognized that women have a different anatomy than men. And, <laughs> and, but the best part of that for me was that now they actually have an environment where women can actually call it out and say, this really doesn't work for me, and, and, and I heard. So life is a lot more different these days, a lot more women. And last week we had uh, an industry conference for, um, for the Canadian Nuclear Association's uh, industry conference. And usually the regulator spent some time talking about what's happening. And uh, this time I invited uh, my fellow regulators from the UK and the USA to, say, uh, to share the podium with me. And all three women, first time ever. And 15 years ago, if you went to the CNA conference, if you looked around in an audience of about 800, you could count on one hand the number of women that were there. Not this year. And the three of us didn't even have to open our mouths because the image was so powerful that women have found their rightful place in this industry. So tomorrow, I'm at a session that uh, Ambassador uh, Heidi Hulan's uh, uh, championing and moderating on what we can do to get to gender equity. So I'm not going to spend much time on that today, um, so you have to come tomorrow to hear that. <laughs> but, but I do want to finish off with, as I look ahead, what, what is it that I see? And I get questioned quite often by women and men that, what about the boys and the men who feel that they're not getting the opportunities, that they're getting pushed out? Because when you talk about gender balance, some are winning for, and some have to lose to get to that balance. And so I'd like to finish by saying, I think we need to reframe the conversation. It's not a balance where some win and some lose. It really is, the analogy I like is that of a candle. A lit candle, if it's used to light another candle, it doesn't lose any of its power, but now you've got twice as much light. And if those candles are used to light another bunch of candles, you've got a room full of light without any one of them losing any of their luminosity, their power. And I see gender balance the same way, that you're not taking opportunities from anyone. You're actually creating more opportunities you're not squeezing anyone out, you're just making the room bigger. And I'd like to leave you with that image, that that's what gender balance will be. If we all do our part, like the hummingbird, we'll get to gender balance, because having empowered women, we all succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ramina. What a great story, and particularly the hummingbird. I now have this image in my mind as well about what each of us can do for the overall good of contributing to something that we both care about very much. And now I'd like to have the honor of introducing our second speaker, Ms. Marina Balayeva. Marina is the Deputy Director of International Activities and Director of International Cooperation at Rosatom State Atomic Energy Corporation in Russia. She's a leading expert in the areas of non-proliferation, export control, safeguards implementation, and nuclear energy promotion, and manages a number of Rosatom projects in the area of international cooperation. Marina coordinates Rosatom's cooperation with the IEA and is an alternate governor of the Russian Federation to the IEA Board of Governors. Please join me in welcoming Marina to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, Director General uh, Marianne. Uh, it's very difficult to say something <laughs> after <laughs> you. And uh, I would like to present a little bit more personal story about my life in nuclear industry. Uh, first comment, uh, I would like to start from words of Maria Julia Maria Curie. And she said, don't be inspired by person, be inspired by idea. And if we 
could create the conditions for aspiring young women uh, by nuclear industry. It means we will go in the right way to uh, have here more specialists and more ladies. When I graduated from uh, school, I was inspired by the development of nuclear industry. It was really a uh, time when nuclear energy was in a rising, and uh, it presented many uh, possibilities for the women, uh, for men, uh, to apply their knowledge. That's why I was uh, entered in, uh, to Moscow Engineering and Physics Institute, uh, and I think uh, it's my alma mater, it's the best institute <laughs> who prepares specialists for nuclear energy. And uh, I was uh, absolutely in the same position. Uh, in uh, Moscow Engineering and Physics Institute was 5% of young girls. We didn't have a problem with drinking, uh, honestly <laughs> speaking. <laughs> <laughs> but at uh, that, uh, that time, ladies <laughs> were not so uh, many. Uh, that's why today we don't have so many women in nuclear management, I think so. And uh, after I uh, graduated from this institute, I uh, immediately started work in Atom and Form. It was a famous enough institute in uh, Russia, in Soviet Union, because uh, it will, uh, his acti uh, activity of this institute was uh, dealing with uh, um, cooperation with the IAEA. And from very start, I worked in safeguarding of Soviet facilities, an uh, improvement of accountancy and control of nuclear material from point of say, application of safeguards in Russia, and uh, also was dealing with question of functioning of inner system. It was a very good time, it was a very interesting job, and I participated in uh, many events. And uh, very shortly, uh, I was moved from this institute to Ministry of Atomic Energy, then to, uh, and I sta stayed in the ministry for whole my life. Uh, then it was Federal Agency for Atomic Energy, now it's State Corporation Rosatom. But nevertheless, whole my life, I am in nuclear industry, and uh, in nuclear ministry. And uh, my responsibilities will, was uh, raised every day. I um, started to work in export controls. It was, uh, for me, extremely interesting topic. Uh, I participated in nuclear suppliers group meetings. It is a question of nuclear expertise. It is a question uh, of nuclear trade. And you have a possibility to imagine what does it mean nuclear market and what uh, does it mean nuclear cooperation, cooperation and peaceful use of nuclear energy. Uh, after export controls, uh, I was involved in non-proliferation topics. It's uh, NPT review conference, conferences. It's also good opportunities to know about nuclear sphere, how it should work, so what does it mean on proliferation. I participated in three uh, review and PT conferences and, and prep, uh, prep comms meetings, and uh, it was good school for me. And uh, after this uh, now, from that time to now, I involve in uh, peaceful use of nuclear energy and cooperation of Russia with different states, bilateral cooperation, and also it is also an interesting topic. What is exciting in my life? Uh, it is short history, what was exciting too? I would like to stress two stories. First, it is creation uh, of first fuel bank of IAEA. Uh, it was done starting from 2005, and uh, I'd like to say, of course, uh, it was a team uh, of specialists who worked to create uh, first um, uh, 
International Enrichment Center in Angarsk, and then creation of reserve of uh, low enriched uranium for the IAEA. But uh, practical job was done by me and uh, my uh, young uh, colleague uh, who also graduated from MIFI and Nadezhda Kozlova. We was two who done this job. <laughs> so it was uh, very exciting. It was uh, five years approximately. Um, all steps was done uh, during five years. In uh, 2007 uh, was created uh, EUC in Angarsk, and 2010 was signed an agreement with the IAEA about creation guarantee reserve. And at the end of 2010, uh, this uh, reserve was created. Now it's under safeguards. It's available in Angarsk. And uh, today, when I met and starts during meeting <laughs> in your office, I remember the, remembered another exciting story. It is our conference in 2013, which was done uh, from our side. I was responsible for preparation of this conference, and from uh, IAEA and STARS was responsible for this conference. <laughs> and it was one year uh, hard job, I would say, and we walked uh, on uh, every week, every day basis. Uh, I spent, it seems to me, half a year here in Leningrad, St. Petersburg. It was a great time. It was a great team, and I would like to thank one more time Anne for this absolutely great experience of cooperation uh, with this nice colleague, with this bright woman from IEA. <laughs> and uh, uh, what should I add uh, to what was said uh, earlier? Uh, I absolutely agree with uh, uh, one approach. I understand and I absolutely support all the activity which is going on in IAEA uh, in, uh, in a direction to try to reach an equally, uh, equal representation of men and women. But more significant is to create relevant conditions for men and for the women. Very often for women it's a little bit more difficult because uh, it is a nature, we should uh, give life to our children, <laughs> we should spend some time with them. That's why ladies very often two, three, sometimes four years late in career. But it is natural situation and if family supported uh, a woman, if uh, management of the office support the woman, if colleagues support a woman, in this case, she has all possibilities to make a career in such a difficult sphere as a nuclear industry. And I think in this case, in, in this way, uh, the role of the agency uh, goes first, I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. Thank you. Um, I didn't go to uh, engineering school, but I think I would have had no problem in either case. <laughs> and now I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our final speaker, Ms. Amelia Li Ziyi. Amelia is the mentoring coordinator of the UN Nuclear Young Generation at the IAEA and has led the development and implementation of the IA's first cross-departmental mentoring program with the support of our MTHR. Amelia has worked at the IA for the past three years, first as an intern, then as a consultant, and now at the joint FAO IAEA Division of Nuclear Technologies in Food and Agriculture. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Amelia Li Zi Yi to the stage. Thank you very much, Mary Alice, for that very gracious introduction. Mom and Dad are listening on live stream, so it's good that they finally know what I do at work. <laughs> what an honor it is to stand before all of you on this very special day. Before I begin, I'm going to let you in on one little secret. You see, a few months ago, when I was asked, would you be interested in being a part of this event? 
I had to try very hard to keep my cool. I said, mm, yeah, sure, why not? But inside, I was exploding with excitement. I get a chance to share my story on International Women's Day? Of course! What ensued was two weeks of deep reflection on what I would bring to the table to this conversation. Upon much deep soul-searching, I came to the realization that my biggest achievement during my time here was the development of a mentoring community at the IAEA. And so today, I stand here before you as the mentoring coordinator of the IAEA's first cross-departmental mentoring program, where I hope to share with you how I got here, what mentoring means to me, and how all of us can and should become mentors. Let's go back two years ago. I was at, oops, sorry, technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. Let's go back two years ago. I was at the UN Nuclear Young Generation's first annual general meeting. I walked into a boardroom filled with 20 people, very young, very professional. They made me feel two emotions at once. The first, self-consciousness. The second, inexplicable attraction. Self-conscious because they all look like they could recite all the 17 SDGs at the snap of a finger. I can't. And at the same time, I was inexplicably drawn to them because they look like the type of motivated and driven people that I wanted to surround myself with. They were filling out executive positions, and of which one of them was for the mentoring coordinator. My brain will never quite understand why, but my hand immediately shot up into the air, and I walked across the stage right to the front where I pitched my case. I had always been heavily involved in mentoring, and so I spoke impassionedly about the time when I mentored children in STEM subjects, or how time and time again, my professional and academic career has benefited from the presence of mentors in my life. Hey, guess who got the job? <laughs> it was a momentous task to start a mentoring program from scratch. Luckily, I wasn't alone. Very quickly, we assembled a team of four, and with the help of the UNNYG core team, Mary Alice and HR, we developed the IAEA's first cross-departmental mentoring program. What was exciting about this program is that for the very first time, junior professionals in all six departments of the IAEA could be paired with a senior professional from a working area that was beyond the positions that they held. Thanks to the hard work of everyone, within five months, we got the program up and running. And ever since then, we've paired 65 mentees to mentors. Honestly, we tried to introduce as much chaos as possible. We paired archives assistants with soil scientists. We paired nuclear engineers with directors of communication. It was great fun, and everybody <laughs> loved it. Now, as a mentoring coordinator during this time, I sometimes get asked, what does mentoring mean to you? To me, mentorship can be summed up in three Gs. Going, guiding, and giving. I'll explain that as I go. The first G, going, relates to paving a way before others, learning the lessons, and passing them back to people behind you. I was one of the first homeschoolers in Malaysia. My only friend was SpongeBob. And when it came time for me to apply to college, I hit a few bumps in the road because I simply didn't have this mentoring, uh, sorry, homeschooling community around me. And with no counselors to lead me, it was quite difficult to know what to do and how to apply to college. Eventually, I succeeded. 
and even better, I earned a $200,000 scholarship to study at Bryn Mawr College, an elite all-women's college in Pennsylvania. That summer, I went home and served as a mentor on a nonprofit organization helping Malaysian students apply to college in the US. I was the mentor, I was the homeschool contact point, and I assisted homeschoolers by giving them guidance on how to apply for college as well as how to search for scholarships. By taking this going that I gained from homeschool to college, I gathered the lessons that I learned and passed them on and successfully guided other homeschoolers in getting to college. Now let's go on to the second G, as opposed to going, guiding is the act of supporting and challenging a young person to be better than who they are. I had always, you know, in my head, fancied myself as a pretty decent public speaker until the first speech I had to give for this mentoring program. I had written my script, I had practiced over and over again, and yet, as I stood there in front of 50 people, I froze. I forgot what I wanted to say. What followed was an excruciating five minutes in which I basically gave commands to everybody in the room. You should do this, you must do that. It was very rude of me. By the end, it was so bad that when I asked my mentor, so how did it go? The only response I got was, please join a public speaking club. And so I did. I went on a journey to improve my public speaking skills. Along that journey, I came up to a few junior professionals to mentor me on how I can be a public speaker, better public speaker. They supported me by reading my scripts and challenged me by giving me honest feedback. What I really appreciated about this guiding mentorship is that they led by example and pushed me to excel beyond what I thought I could. These are the ribbons that I've earned, 21 ribbons out of 30 weeks. And now, finally, the third G, giving. Giving relates to believing in someone and giving them the chance or break that they deserve. A few years ago, I had just graduated with my master's in environmental science from the University of Tokyo. I was feeling on top of the world with this fresh degree. I had all the technical knowledge, but no idea how I could use it in an applied way. I come from a family of accountants and businessmen, and so they, no one had any idea of what to provide me for guidance. I mean, it was either a job in the construction industry, maybe oil and gas. I really didn't want to have hat hair for the next 40 years of my life. And so I started calling and emailing, eager to know what other options I have, what's out there. By pure chance, I was given the contact details of one of the senior scientists here at the agency. I called her up for an informational interview in which she gave me a new perspective. It turns out science can be done in an international organization. She also gave me ideas how my background could be used in the nuclear sector. Those were things I had never thought about until I spoke to her. I didn't think too much about it until a few months later when we reconnected. She asked me, how are you doing? And our conversation ended with me asking, may I please pass you my resume? It turns out my skill sets was an exact match for a position that she wanted to fill at that time. Sometimes the road to nuclear can be as easy as a phone call or more likely, it can be as easy as someone senior believing in you and deciding to give you that break that you want. The best thing about the three Gs in mentorship 
going, guiding, and giving is that it is a positive feedback loop. One of the quotes that are often used to sum up mentorship is this by Isaac Newton, and he reads like this. If I had seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Through this quote and my three examples in going, guiding, and giving, I hope I've showcased to all of you that mentorship is more than just workplace advancement. More importantly, I hope I've showcased that mentorship can happen at any point in your life and your career. You can be that young homeschooler who just got to college telling people how to go where she's gone. You can be that young professional leading and guiding someone in self-improvement. Or you can be that scientist giving a young professional a chance to develop her career. Here at the IAEA, we're very lucky to have mentorship initiatives and senior staff who are more than eager to help us. Sometimes, though, I have to sit and wonder, why is it we as women are so reluctant to see ourselves as mentors? Having run the mentoring program for several years now, we found that women accounted for 75% of our mentees. On the other hand, of the mentors that are available, only 25% are women. Why do we not see ourselves as role models? We need to start believing that our stories matter as well, men and women equal. My key takeaway is that we are all giants in our own rights. Let us give each other an opportunity to stand on our shoulders as we go, guide, and give so we can grow together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amelia. We're going to quickly move uh, some chairs up here onto the stage just to take a few questions from the audience. Um, I'm sure you have many uh, questions you would like to ask our speakers, and I would be very happy to uh, go ahead and moderate. Um, I think this conversation that we'll have for the next few minutes will further enhance and emphasize the importance of stories and people's experiences and how it relates to supporting and advocating uh, for gender equality. So with that, I'd like to invite our speakers up to the stage, please. And I want to thank our, uh, our colleagues here who are doing a very quick job moving. All right. Thank you, Romina. Okay. So in the few minutes that we have left, um, I would like to go ahead and kick off the event with uh, a, the question, a very simple question. Um, please. Was there anyone or any particular event in your life that inspired you to become part of the nuclear community? Let me start with you, Romina. Um, so I don't know if there was anyone that inspired me to be part of the nuclear community, but I will tell you about some folks who were very inspirational to me. And, and I think one that kind of sticks out more than anyone else is probably Elizabeth I. And that's going back many, many centuries. But I think what, what really inspired me about her is, so here's this woman who everyone wanted to kill, who, who took on this role, made a lot of sacrifices, never got married, never had children. Um, but for, a, for moving the country from being a third-rate country, which, which the England was at the time compared to France and Spain and even the Netherlands, uh, making it a superpower in her lifetime. She brought the Protestants and Catholics together, but more importantly, the long-term success that England remained a superpower for, uh, for centuries after. And I think in a very male-dominated environment, she didn't let anything hold her back. She made, um, she made some, she had a great vision and she saw it through. 
And um, I, I often look back to her and saying, yeah, that's one pretty inspirational person. Good, good. Ravina, any thoughts? I mean, Marina? It seems to me I answered in my uh, speech uh, in the very beginning. Uh, I was inspiring by new technology, by new possibilities in new industry, which become part of life. When I started, it was uh, uh, in the very beginning, and uh, today we have huge nuclear industry. And so I was inspiring specific in, uh, in this. Great. Amelia, any thoughts? I definitely have to say, aside from my boss, who gave me that one phone call that basically changed my life, at least for the past three years, it would be everyone in this room, actually. <laughs> I mean, all the good work that is being done, that's inspiration for me every day. Fantastic. Well, let's hear from our inspirational folks then in the room and see what questions we have out there. And uh, we have a microphone up here um, and a microphone in the back. So uh, for all those of you who've been good listeners and have taken away some thoughts, I'm sure there's a question out there that someone would like to ask uh, us to further our discussion before we, we uh, wrap up today. And this is always what you fear when you open up the floor. <laughs> Ambassador Hulan. I'm interested from all three of you if there is one thing that you could change in your place of work that would be helpful to women in nuclear, what would it be right now? Marina? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> well, while you're thinking about it, because I know you've had a lot of experience um, and, and uh, you have seen things, and as you were describing in your story, um, your la length and breadth of experience within um, the, 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 the Soviet and then the Russian nuclear sector, I'm sure there were many things that you've learned and thoughts that you would like to have if you were sort of, you know, ruler for the day, what would you do? <sighs> you know, um, uh, Russian industry, uh, we have such a quick development. We have so many changes every day. We have a lot of contracts. So it's... Uh, mm, I do not see today how we, uh, and what we need to change. For me, it's difficult to <laughs> answer <laughs> <laughs> question. <laughs> Amelia. That one's an easy one for me. I'd say one of the things that I'd love to see change is for women, not just senior position women, but also women who are in my position, to start believing that they can be role models. And perhaps for them to get encouragement from the institution that this is an okay thing to do and it's a good thing to do. Thank you. Good. Romina. And I'd like to add to that. I think uh, for me, um, it, is, it is to create the right work environment that women feel that they have a, a rightful place in the sector. And when they, and they feel comfortable in calling things out that don't fit with what's acceptable behavior. And, and I find that a dream of mine, and I, I was talking to Mary Alice about this earlier, is that an average woman can excel in this sector. And right now, you generally find that you really have to make a lot of sacrifices and be really, really good to, to, to really do well in this sector. And so when I talk about calling out, that it's okay to call out if someone makes a sexist joke, if someone interrupts you mid-speech, if someone steals your idea, or doesn't give you opportunities because you have young children, I'd like, if I could change one thing, it's permitting that to happen freely. Good, very good. Well, thank you everyone. We've had a really wonderful afternoon and we've enjoyed our time with all of you. 
I want to thank those of you who are on our social media universe for sticking it out with us and being part of our conversation. I also want to especially thank our speakers. This is a tough thing to do, standing on a platform without notes, thinking about what you want to say, and connecting with each of you. And I think we've achieved that today, and I'm really satisfied that, that all of us have learned something. I want to thank Rumina, Marina, and Amelia for your efforts and for your stories and for your honesty and openness to what I think is a really important conversation. We've learned a lot today. Thank you, everyone, and have a good International Women's Day. <laughs>